Thank you for that introduction. Uh, my name is Andrew Blumenfeld. I'm director of the Headache Center of Southern California, and I work in San Diego, California. And I'm pleased to be able to spend some time with you speaking to you about migraine headaches, specifically between acute attack management and attack prevention. These are my disclosures, and I work for a number of different companies as a consultant involved with advisory board meetings, promotional speaking, uh, research grants, and author, also as an author. Today's discussion is going to cover six main areas. Firstly, we're going to talk about the unmet needs in migraine treatment. Then I will review with you the pathophysiology of migraine and focus down on the mechanism of action of RayVal. We're then going to look at the clinical trial results, the pivotal trials that allowed RayVal to get its FDA approval, and we'll cover safety, dosing, and end with some clinical examples of how you might consider using this treatment in your practice. So as we start to look at migraine, most migraine patients have emphasized in many different epidemiological trials that what they want from an acute treatment is to be rapidly free of pain, not just pain relief, but actually a complete elimination of pain. So this pain-free variable has become the gold standard and what the FDA now uses to allow acute migraine treatments to be approved. When we look back at the uh, tryptan era, many uh, of those studies used the pain relief variable, which is not as stringent. Pain relief means that you can still have a mild pain or be pain-free, but the shift now is to completely eliminate the pain and fit more in line with what patients want. And the International Headache Society has adopted the two-hour pain-free result as the standard. This uh, is an important point because this guideline is now part of many different uh, recommendations across many different headache organizations. And so what we're looking at is moving patients from a moderately severe headache, not a mild headache, a moderately severe headache, to complete pain freedom and to be able to achieve that within a two hour window after taking the treatment. And this ideally should be reproduced across multiple attacks so that we get a consistent response. Now I've extended this into my clinical practice. And one of the standard questions that you want to ask a patient when they come back to you and you've started a new migraine treatment is what are you like two hours after you've taken that treatment? Has your headache gone away completely? Are you pain-free? Because if you're not pain-free at that two-hour mark, we should consider switching you to an alternative treatment. The other question that I add to that is the sustained pain freedom, which means that they remain free of pain through 24 hours after they've taken the medication. And if they're not achieving it, then I think again about what other treatments I could start to, to use in a patient like that. Now we know that the trip downs, which came out in the 90s were a tremendous benefit for our migraine patients. And they, they dramatically changed the way that we care for migraine, but they don't help every patient. Not everybody becomes pain-free using a trip down. In addition to that, trip downs have a lot of adverse event issues, tolerability issues. Many patients, have uh, told us about warm, flushed, hot feelings, dizziness, drowsiness. These have been um, limiting in some patients. And then even more importantly, are the potential for cardiovascular issues. So tryptans narrow down the caliber of blood vessels. And as a result, they carry a warning for cardiovascular and coronary artery disease type patients um, that this uh, might be a problem in that patient population. So as a result, 
we have a lot of unmet needs in the acute treatment landscape. And having a medication with a completely different mechanism of action is ideal to think about switching our patients who are not doing well on triptans. You know, historically what's happened is that patients have been started on triptans, they may not have become pain free on them. And instead of having something else to go to, we've gone to the, the next triptan in line. And we switch from one triptan to the next triptan to the next. And because that has the same mechanism of action, it's unlikely that you're gonna see a tremendous change as you make those switches. You're not likely to see a change in adverse events because the adverse events are common across the group and the efficacy is very similar. So ideally looking at a drug that has an alternative mechanism of action um, is, is a very good approach um, as, we, as we look at these patients who are not achieving pain freedom. It's important uh, to keep pushing forward on this pain freedom message because it's been well shown that if the acute migraine attack is not well controlled, patients tend to progress over time and the headaches become more and more uh, frequent. So controlling the acute attack can prevent progression to the more chronic form of migraine. This has uh, been shown uh, repeatedly now um, in a number of studies, and the best one has been done by, by Richard Lipton. And what he looked at was the transformation from episodic migraine to chronic migraine. And the rate of transformation on an annual basis is a little less than 3%. So you know, approximately 3% of the episodic migraine patients will transform over the course of the year to a chronic migraine state. Now, if you control the acute attack, you limit the duration, you limit the severity of the acute attack, you have an effective acute treatment, you can decrease that rate of transformation down to 1.9%. On the other side of the coin, if you don't have a good acute treatment, if the patient's attack is allowed to continue and there is no um, effort made to stop it, then the rate of transformation increases to 6.8% over, over a year. Now this makes sense because the disease of migraine is a sensitizing disease. The more often the brain is exposed to migraine, the easier it is for the brain to trigger into migraine the threshold for the pathways that are activated decreases. And so now it becomes easier and easier to trigger into attacks. So what you really want to do in your management of these patients is to shorten the amount of time that the brain is exposed to migraine. That is the best way of controlling the progression of this disease. Now it's well known that the pathways that are involved in migraine can be broken down into peripheral pathways and central pathways. The peripheral pathways are outside of the blood-brain barrier. And the pathways that we're gonna be looking at are the trigeminal nerve, the trigeminal ganglion, and the trigeminal nerve branches. Now the, the trigeminal nerve is a bipolar neuron. And the neuron sits in the ganglion, and then there's a distal axon that travels out to the meninges and a proximal axon that travels back to synapse in the brainstem in the trigeminal nucleus caudalis. The peripheral axis axon that's going out to the meninges is typically a first division branch of the trigeminal nerve. And housed within that trigeminal nerve are vesicles, little blister packets that contain vasoactive peptides. CGRP is one of those vasoactive peptides. It's not the only one that gets released from these trigeminal nerve endings. These vasoactive peptides get released around the meningeal blood vessels and they produce vasodilatation, activation of inflammatory mediators and a neurogenic inflammatory process. This causes the throbbing headache that's made worse by head movement.
as these messages travel back now to the brainstem, activating the trigeminal nucleus and the pathways traveling up from the trigeminal nucleus to the thalamus, the patients develop a very typical symptom called allodynia. And allodynia means that as you touch the hair or the scalp with light touch, it is perceived as a painful stimulus. Allodynia typically develops about an hour or two into the migraine attack. Now, when you give a trip down, the way that it works is that it activates serotonin receptors. It specifically binds to 5-HT1 receptors. And these are inhibitory receptors. So when you bind to them, it leads to inhibition. And the subtype of 5-HT1 receptors that tryptans bind to are the 1B and the 1D. And the 1Bs are predominantly found on blood vessels. The 1Ds are predominantly found on the trigeminal nerve and the ganglion. So when the tryptan binds to those receptors, activates them, it leads to narrowing down of the caliber of the meningeal blood vessel. It switches off the trigeminal nerve and it stops the release of the vasoactive peptides. So that's the mechanism of action of the tryptans. But importantly, the tryptans only work in the periphery. They're not able to cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's very well known that as soon as a patient becomes allodynic, which is a marker that the central pathways have been activated, messages are going up from trigeminal nucleus to thalamus, once they're allodynic, we're not going to get the same efficacy with tryptans. We have to treat early in the attack before they're allodynic. Now, if we look at where Rayval works, Rayval also binds to serotonin receptors of the 5-HD1 class. The 5-HD1 class are the inhibitory receptors. Rayval will bind to these 1F receptors. So the subtype of receptor that it binds to is different than what the tryptans are binding to. The 1F receptor is found on the trigeminal nerve endings, but not on the blood vessels. There are no 1Fs in any significant number on the meningeal blood vessels. The 1Fs are present on the trigeminal ganglion, and they're also present in the central pathways, that trigeminal nucleus caudalis and the pathways that go up from the trigeminal nucleus to the thalamus, the trigeminothalamic tract. So with the 5-HT1F activation, we are able to inhibit the trigeminal nerve from firing, but not cause vasoconstriction of meningeal blood vessels because there are no 1Fs on the blood vessels. In addition to acting in the periphery, Rayval is thought to cross the blood-brain barrier and have effects on the central pathways. So therefore, it can switch off those pathways traveling up from the trigeminal nucleus caudalis up to the thalamus. So even if the patient was allodynic, your option to treat is much wider. Your window of opportunity to treat is quite different from a tryptan. Remember, allodynia occurs one to two hours into the migraine attack. So with the tryptan, you'd have to get in in that first hour. Now, Rayval is the first of a new group of medicines called the Ditans. Rayval is the only medication in that group at the moment. When we look at migraine-specific treatments, we now have the tryptans, the Ditan, and the GPANs. These are specific treatments designed to treat migraine, and we can add ergots to that list. So Rayval, which the name before it got approved was lasmitidan, has very high affinity for this 5-HD1F receptor. So 440 times greater affinity for that receptor than for the 1B and the 1D. So you're not going to get any significant binding to the 1B and the 1D.
and it's going to bind to that receptor. But because it's inhibitory, it produces an inhibitory effect when you activate it. It's very interesting that it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So it has a lipophilic component that allows it to penetrate that man membrane and therefore act both peripherally and centrally. So this is a strong distinguishing feature between Rayval and the tryptans. Now, if we look at the phase three clinical studies, the two main study types that were done, the Spartan study and the Samurai study, both of these are an episodic migraine. Again, this is the type of migraine patient that the FDA requires be studied. They don't allow acute treatments to be studied in chronic migraine. So these are patients who have fewer than 15 headache days a month, have met criteria for migraine. And the studies involve just treating a single attack. But the single attack requires that the headache have reached a moderate to severe intensity. They can't treat in these clinical trials when the patient is mild. So the clinical trial design is a little bit different from what you would typically do in practice where you might encourage a patient correctly to treat early. In a clinical trial, it has to wait until the patient is moderately severe. Now patients that have cardiovascular risk factors were allowed into these trials because there was no vasoconstriction to worry about. Different doses of lasmitidan were tested against placebo, ranging from a 50 milligram dose through 100 milligram up to a 200 milligram dose. Now these are double blind placebo controlled trials. The FDA requires that you have two double blind placebo controlled trials in order to get a medication approved. But then in addition to that, there is a open label long-term safety trial called the, the Gladiator trial. And uh, we'll be going through the data on each of these. So the primary endpoint is shifting patients from the moderately severe pain to pain freedom at two hours. And the second primary endpoint is losing the most bothersome symptom. So what the most bothersome symptom means is that the patients need to have either nausea, photophobia, or phonophobia. So they need one of those three at the start of their attack to qualify it as a migraine that can now be treated. It has to be moderately severe with either nausea, photophobia, or photophobia. And the patient needs to pick one of those symptoms and label it as their most bothersome symptom. The most bothersome symptom is then followed through that two hour period to see if it goes away. Interestingly, in all the acute migraine treatment trials that have taken place over the, the year, last year or two, that this variable has been put in place, the most bothersome symptom in all of the trials has been photophobia. Now that doesn't mean that photophobia is more disabling than say nausea it's that more patients have photophobia than nausea. And so photophobia gets picked more often as the most bothersome symptom. And then an additional efficacy endpoint that we're gonna look at is pain relief. So this is the one where the patients move from moderately severe to mild to no pain. This is the one that most of the tryptans got approved with. Now, if we look at the pivotal trial results across the two studies and looking at the different doses that were tested against placebo, what you can see is that for the 200 milligram dose, pain freedom at two hours is between 32 and 39%, easily separating from placebo at 15 to 21%. And as we come down in the dose, we still have separation from placebo for each of the doses that are tested, but the percentage of patients that achieve that starts to drop off. So this is very helpful in clinical practice because you could start a patient at the 50 milligram dose, 
see how they're doing. If they're not doing adequately for a future attack, you could upgrade them to the 100 milligram dose. Again, if they were not doing well enough, you could push to the 200 milligram dose. So you, you do have an option in practice and you might see increasing benefit. But I want you to keep the efficacy numbers in the back of your mind. This 39% at the upper end is a very good number in terms of pain freedom, but that's achieved with the 200 milligram dose. Now, when we look at the adverse events, the higher the dose, you get slightly more in terms of the adverse events. So there are gonna be patients where you might want to shift and start with the lower dose. You still got 29% of them pain-free, 28 to 29% of them pain-free at two hours um, using either 50 or 100 milligram dosing. Now, if we look at pain relief, so shifting the patients from moderately severe to mild or no pain, the numbers go up. Now we're 60 to 65% of patients that are achieving the pain relief variable. Pain relief correlates very well with a return to function. So patients typically can get back to work um, almost at full steam if they've achieved pain relief. So close to two thirds of the patients who've taken Rayval will be able to function normally at uh, the two hour window. If we look at losing the most bothersome symptom, and as I mentioned, most of the time this was photophobia, you see between 41 all the way up to 49% of the patients are losing that symptom by two hours. And these are all statistically separating from the placebo group. Now, if we look at patients who have been on trip dance and have either done well or poorly on trip dance and then judge how well they do in the trials where they get rave out, what we see is that it doesn't make a big difference whether they've done poorly on a trip down or not. So you can't use a trip down response as a predictor of how the patient will do on Rayval. The dosing of Rayval is, is, is a big variable in terms of how well patients do, but where the trip dance have any effect is, is irrelevant. So don't use that as a, as a measure. Don't say, you know, you, you didn't do well on Triptan, it's a serotonin drug, so is Rayval. You're unlikely to do well on Rayval because they're binding to different receptors. Now, if we look at the side effect profile, what you'll see is that there is a distinction between the 50, the 100, and the 200 milligram dose. So let's start off by looking at dizziness. So we see dizziness at the 50 milligram dose in about 9% of patients. And that almost doubles when we look at the 200 milligram dose. Importantly, most of the patients, the dizziness that they reported was very mild. In terms of it being a severe dizziness at the 50 milligram dose, it was less than 0.3%. And at the 200 milligram dose was only 1.4%. So this is taking into account all dizziness, like mild lightheadedness is included in this definition of dizziness. But nevertheless, there is this dose effect. If we look at fatigue, not as prominent, slightly higher in the 200 milligram group, paresthesias, sedation, nausea, and then muscle weakness. Now I like to combine muscle weakness, sedation and fatigue, and lump those all together. Because when I'm talking to a patient, whether it's a, a mental fatigue, a need to sleep, or a physical fatigue, I feel that that's all very similar. And so those numbers, when you look at it for the, the 200 milligram group, you're looking at about 15% of the patients in, in aggregate that might have some of those symptoms. And that's going to be a little bit less um, if you go down to the, the 50 milligram group. So if I have a sensitive patient who is afraid of side effects, I'm definitely going to start at the 50 milligram dose. 
If I have a more refractory patient, um, then I might push to 100 or even 200 milligrams. Um, this is a once a day dose. There's no second dosing um, with any of this data. Um, Raval is given as a single dose per attack. Now, if we look at uh, the Gladiator study, which looked at an open label experience across multiple attacks, and we look at the patients who had transient adverse events at the 100 milligram dose and the 200 milligram dose, the 200 milligram doses in the darker green, 100 milligram doses in the lighter green. What we can see is that there is a trend. As we go through each of these attacks, the adverse event reporting is dropping off. So there does seem to be a tolerance to this. And I think this is an important message for patients. So the way that I would present this to a patient is to tell them, you might get some dizziness or fatigue with the first dose, but if you keep taking it across multiple attacks, that adverse event is gonna go away. So you should try to persist with this treatment. Now, it may not go away completely, but it could lessen, and it's not gonna be as prominent as it might've been in the first attack or two. Now, Rayval fell into a category of drugs that cross the blood-brain barrier. So the FDA required that because it has a centrally acting effect, that it be checked for the ability to interfere with driving. And this was a new guideline that the FDA brought out in 2017. And now going forward, all centrally acting drugs will have to go through this driving evaluation. What's done with the driving evaluation is that you take volunteers, not migraine patients, because migraine itself can interfere with driving. So we don't wanna take a, a patient in the midst of a migraine and then try and test whether they can drive because they might not do well. But you take healthy volunteers that don't have migraine. And then what you do is you put them in front of a computer screen and you have them do a simulated test where they have to drive between two lines without swerving from side to side. And you give them a drug and then you see if they swerve. And interestingly, when patients did that, these healthy volunteers, they did swerve between the lines and they didn't do well for about 90 minutes after they took the drug. The FDA came out and gave an eight hour driving restriction on Rayval based on this, as well as the sedation, fatigue, drowsy symptom, and said that it would not be safe to operate a vehicle for eight hours. So this is very important because when you prescribe Rayval, you need to document in your notes that you told the patient not to drive because if they inadvertently drove and had an accident, they might falsely attribute it, attribute it back to you for giving them the Rayval. But the important point here, because many providers when they first hear this, is that they immediately say, that doesn't sound like a good option for my patients. The important point is that migraine itself is a, is a condition that interferes with driving. Patients in the midst of a bad migraine should not be driving. So the way that I recommend that patients start with Rayval is that if they get an attack, they get home, they no longer have to drive and they take their medication. This is not something where you wanna say, take it and get in the car and then drive home. That would obviously be the wrong advice. Because of the, the uh, driving issue, we know that there is other CNS depressant medications or things like alcohol, clearly that would worsen that effect. Um, and that's an important point to tell patients about and to remind them that part of the efficacy of Rayval is that it crosses the blood-brain barrier and can work centrally. And that means it could work later in the attack, but it also means that we have to be concerned about dizziness and drowsiness, which are typical central nervous system adverse events. 
But what the Gladiator study showed us is that the, the safety really over the course of multiple attacks was very good and that these side effects were transient and were not noted at a, at a high level. The formulations that got approved are the 50 milligram dose and the 100 milligram dose. So that if you want a patient to take the 200 milligram dose, you need to do two 100s. As I already mentioned, it's a single dose that's used per attack. In the clinical trials, we waited until the patients were moderately severe to treat. But in practice, the advice we want to give is once you're in a safe environment, you don't need to drive for eight hours, take your medicine as soon as possible during the attack, because that will give you the best opportunity to have even a better result than we saw in, in the clinical trials. That's what I've noticed in my practice. So now I'd like to just walk you through two cases so that you can see um, how you could consider using this in your, in your clinical practice. So our first case is a 32-year-old woman, and she's had a history of recurrent disabling headache. It first started in her late teens, about 18 years of age, and their attacks are occurring at least uh, once or twice a month. So usually with her menstruation at mid-cycle, she's getting an attack. And the and attacks can last a couple of days. These are not short duration. The attacks are usually preceded by visual aura. It's in the right visual field. It lasts about 20 minutes. And then as that clears, the patient develops a hemicranial headache on the left side, which is throbbing. It's worsened by bending over or moving, and she feels nauseated with it. Now, if we look at her, her headache diary, what we see is that in addition to these uh, more significant attacks, she's having some milder headache days. Some of them are just a one or a, a three out of 10, but then she has her more severe days. And the more severe days, she's been using a triptan to treat but she's not getting uh, full relief with that. And she's also experiencing some adverse events like the flushing and the jaw discomfort that you've often seen. And she's tried two different uh, trip dance and uh, both times got the flushing, chest discomfort, sense of fatigue from them. And she tried taking these later in the headache because they were the sedating effect was, was significant and she couldn't continue to work if she took a trip down. So she would wait till she got home and took it. But then she found um, that it didn't really help her headaches at all um, because she was already allodynic and it was too late for that trip down to, to provide benefits. She's only having you know, a couple of severe attacks a month and uh, some milder headaches, but not that many. And so she doesn't really warrant going on to a preventative treatment. So the approach with her is to do some behavioral modification, make sure that uh, she's getting adequate sleep and exercise, that she's well hydrated, not fasting, eating regular meals, that her caffeine intake is less than 200 milligrams a day, too much caffeine, often uh, can lead to an escalation of headaches. And we like to use magnesium supplements as a means of limiting the number of attacks, uh, usually magnesium glycinate, 500 milligrams a day, uh, works well as a migraine preventative. But in addition, she's a very good candidate for Rava. She's already tried two trip dance, she doesn't need a preventative treatment. We're going to do the behavioral modification, but we do need to optimize her acute care because we want to make sure that her brain is not having these long exposures to migraine, which could over time lead to progression and cause her to transform into a chronic migraine patient. So we want to be aggressive in our management and not just leave her with this inadequate response to a trip down. 
So I chose to start on Rayvard 100 milligrams. So middle of the road, um, because I'm gonna tell her to take this later in the day when she's at home. Because Rayvard is able to cross the blood brain barrier, I know that if she treats later in the attack, I'm still gonna see a benefit. And I know that because in the clinical trials, people waited to treat until they were moderately severe. And then they actually had four hours in which to take their treatment. And even at the tail end of that four hours, benefit was still noted. So I'm using that to help me guide this patient to treat. Once she gets home, she's not gonna be driving. If she's getting dizzy or fatigued, she can go to sleep. She's gonna wake up the next day feeling fine. She has a close over 33% chance of becoming pain-free within two hours before she goes to, goes to bed even. Um, and that's exactly what happened with her. And her most bothersome symptom was nausea. And that went away in the, in the same time period. Um, she had a little bit of dizziness, a little bit of fatigue, but when she woke up the next morning, she felt refreshed. There was no residual drowsiness. Everything was gone. She'd had a good night's sleep and she then had uh, a normal day. So a simple change uh, to her treatment, dramatic change in her lifestyle. If you think about it, you know, a person who's having two bad attacks per month, um, that's gonna end up being 24 days per year at a minimum that these patients are gonna be disabled and out of work. Um, that's a long time. Uh, I can easily fix that by giving her a prescription like Ravel. Uh, at follow-up, uh, she uh, has continued to use this treatment. She's had the same result across multiple attacks now. No, not an inconsistent effect, um, which is also a very important question to ask at the follow-up visits. Does this consistently keep you from getting a recurrence of your headache? And uh, she's at full function the following day. The next case that we're gonna look at is a 43 year old woman coming in with a main complaint of headaches. She's also had headaches since her teens, but those have escalated. They started at a low level and now they've built up and she's having headaches nearly every day. And these headaches have typical migraine features, nausea, photophobia, phonophobia, and because she's having so many headaches, she's been tried on lots of different oral preventative treatments like topiramate, amitriptyline, and she hasn't achieved control. In fact, she got a lot of adverse events from these uh, treatments and could not tolerate them. She tried taking uh, triptans, but unfortunately, these only had a partial benefit and did not get her to a pain-free state. So when I ask her, what do you like two hours after taking the trip down? Headaches are already coming back. I got very little relief, just a slight dip in my intensity, and then the headache was returning. And this is what her headache diary looks like. And the red bars are the days that she's using trip downs. So she's at high risk for developing medication overuse headache. Now this is a, is a two month diary and she's using triptans on 13 days out of the two months. So she doesn't meet criteria for medication overuse, but she's clearly at risk. She does not have an adequate acute treatment. I think that's obvious from her diary. And she needs better prevention and she needs a better acute treatment. I think you can see all of that from this. She's having many disabling days with headaches up to eight out of 10. And then in between these bad attacks, she's still suffering and um, you know, having moderate headache a lot of the time. So she was a very good candidate for emgality. So she got a loading dose in the clinic. So two 120 milligram auto injectors, one on each thigh. So the loading dose was 240 milligrams. And she started that and what you can see here is the pivotal trial result. And very similar to this data, uh, where you see patients improving 
over a month and then sustaining. Um, this is exactly what we see in clinical practice. Now, the data that we're looking at here is uh, looking at patients over six months, and these were patients with episodic uh, migraine with clear separation from placebo. And I must say that in practice, I'm seeing a very similar effect with amgality for my chronic migraine patients as I saw with my episodic patients. The percentage of patients that are getting a reduction in their, their migraine days, the 75% reduction is the one that I like to look at. And this is a, a very robust response. And we're seeing 34 to 39% of the patients on Mgality getting a reduction in migraine days of 75% or more. Now you can get some patients with 100% reduction, lower numbers, and some with a 50% or better reduction, easier to achieve that. But I like to remember at least a third of patients getting 75% better on Mgality. Um, if we follow this through in the open label trial that was done on Mgality, what we can see is that as the patients stay on treatment across the course of this year, there's an improvement in their responses. Their, their migraine days come down, they stay down and they trend downwards. Again, this gets back to this theory that the less time the brain is exposed to migraine, the less likely it is to trigger into migraine. So we're decreasing sensitization. But it would be nice to further decrease it with a good acute treatment option. Now, Mgality, very well tolerated across the clinical trials. Most patients were, were able to stay on treatment long-term the discontinuation rates less than 2%. The main adverse events that are reported are injection site uh, reactions, not um, a lot of other systemic uh, side effects. So our patient was started on Mgality and we're looking at uh, a three month uh, diary now after she was put on treatment and she's showing very similar results to what we saw in the Mgality pivotal trials. We're seeing a dramatic reduction in her headache days, including the days that she needs to take trip dance. She's still down um, with four days out of the three months where she's needing a trip down. But you can even see on this that the trip down is, is allowing headache recurrence. The headaches are coming back. So as a result, she's a very good candidate to add Rayval to Mgality. And I used the 200 milligram dose to control these uh, breakthrough headaches. I made a very good point that she should not drive. And I documented that in her medical record. And, and it's clear in that record and in my discussion with her that she's warned not to drive for eight hours after she takes it. But what was demonstrated with this is that she developed a pain-free state and she did that within two hours. Her most bothersome symptoms went away and she had a full return of function using the combination of Mgality and Rayva. So the Mgality has continued monthly at 120 milligrams after the, the loading dose of 240 milligrams was given. And then the Rayva, she has to take the 200 milligrams and she can do that at bedtime. She's very comfortable knowing that she has a consistent method of getting her migraine under control. And over time, the adverse events have dissipated. She's not noticing uh, fatigue or dizziness. Um, she really hasn't had that, right? It doesn't mean because it's listed as an adverse event that it's gonna happen in every patient. In this case, uh, the adverse event reporting is, is really not of any significance. And now, now that she's been on treatment longer, she's tolerating it very well without any issues. In terms of the Mgality, the only thing that she's noted is a little bit of redness around the injection point. 
We only worry with that uh, skin reaction if there is a very broad rash and that there's fluid in the skin, angioedema. If that happened, then we would not reuse Engality. But a little bit of redness, even a little bit of swelling at the injection point where the fluid has gone in, that is not going to be of concern. Importantly, she has had no constipation and she's had no hypertension. Uh, so we do monitor for these um, potential adverse events, but I really have not seen these as a major issue with, with Engality. So in summary, Ravel is a new treatment option for you to think about. It has a different mechanism of action. It's going to bind to the 5-HD1F receptor, and it's going to be able to do that both peripherally and centrally. As a result of this very specific action, it's going to switch off that trigeminal nerve. So you're going to see pain relief numbers and pain freedom numbers that are very significant. 39% of the patients pain-free at two hours on that 200 milligram dose. But it's not just the pain that's been treated, but the whole migraine. So the most bothersome symptoms like nausea, photophobia, photophobia, those are all going to go away. And the adverse events, we do have to be cautious, dizziness, drowsiness, particularly on the first dose or two. But then the longer the patient takes treatment, the less we're going to see those adverse events.